Mr Fred Cheney um, will be well known to um, all of you, of course, through his distinguished career in politics and since then. He, after a period in private practice, he entered parliament. He was in the Senate until 1990 and was leader of opposition in the Senate from 1983 to 1990 and was a member of the House of Representatives from 1990 to 1993. He had a number of ministerial appointments, including Aboriginal Affairs, Social Security and Minister, assisting the Minister for National Development and Energy. His involvement with Aboriginal Affairs has been long-standing. He was involved in the Aboriginal Legal Service in a voluntary capacity from the 1970s. In 1994, he co-founded the Graham Polly Farmer Foundation, established to help young Aboriginal people succeed. He has been a part-time member a full-time member and Deputy President of the Native Title Tribunal. He has served as co-chair of Reconciliation Australia and continues as a director. And he is now a member of the expert panel on constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians. Among his many awards include an appointment as Office of the Order of Australia and he was the first recipient of the Sir Ronald Wilson Leadership Award. I'm very pleased uh, to to welcome to the podium Fred Cheney, who will speak to his paper, Integrity in Parliament, Where Does Duty Lie? Uh, thank you very much for that generous introduction. Can I start by acknowledging the uh, traditional owners of this country? And in the Victorian context, can I say on my study wall at home, I have uh, a facsimile of the Batman Treaty. And I like having it there because it reminds me of the history whereby we, for, what, nearly 200 years, denied the reality of Aboriginal property rights. And that treaty, of course, represents it in a very sharp historical sense. And uh, I had the pleasure and the privilege, as you've been told, of working in native title. I think the wonderful revolution of Mabo is a reminder that there was a long period of injustice that what we say in acknowledging traditional owners is not a matter of political correctness or of some sort of minor folly, it is actually part of Australian reality. And uh, I think that's one of the ways we've changed for the better as a country. Uh, the second thing, I'd like to contest one thing about the introduction that um, I would be well known for my political career. I can see some people here who are under 50, which means that um, they would know nothing about my political career and I apologise. All I can say is that I, I was a rogue like the rest of them and you should take with a considerable degree of scepticism anything I say here tonight. Uh, I want to start actually by uh, quoting uh, a politician and it's a quotation which has a particular historical significance for me because it was up on the wall of um, John Hewson's uh, office in Parliament House when I went to tell him in 1992 that I was leaving politics. Uh, I might say it was the nicest conversation I ever had with John Hewson. He seemed to relax completely and talk to me in a very friendly way and I don't know quite know what that meant. But there it was on the wall and it was this quotation which many of you will know from Theodore Roosevelt. It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there's no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place will never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. And what I said to John was, I won't be a critic sniping from the sidelines. I, I do understand the force of that quotation. And I was very happy to make that commitment because I was in Parliament for just under 20 years and I never looked to an ex-politician for guidance. Now, why would you never look to an ex-politician for guidance? Well, the simple factual reality is that when you arrive in Parliament, your country faces all sorts of problems which you are there trying to solve. And who left you with those problems? 
the previous generation of politicians. So it's perfectly logical that you take no notice of your predecessors. You, the new generation, are going to Parliament to solve the problems they left behind. And I have honoured that undertaking to John Hewson in the main. I do reserve the right and have reserved the right to speak on matters in which I currently work and have worked since I left Parliament so long ago. I have talked publicly and appeared before parliamentary committees on matters relating to Aboriginal Australia and public administration relating to Indigenous people, on the treatment of refugees where my involvement has been to support the active involvement of my wife Angela, and on the deficiencies of the governance of governments in remote Australia which impact very heavily on the 5% of Australians who live, both black and white Australians who live there. And so I've also in private adopted the same critical attitude towards politicians as the normal Australian citizen. And I suppose I've privately often given expressions of irritation at the seemingly mindless carry-on, the adversarial carry-on, which is built into the party system. And when I was invited to give this address, I accepted because of the frequency of the complaints about the state of our politics and I thought, yes, this is a subject which is worth thinking about and addressing. At a time when there is so much irritation and dissatisfaction, uh, I want to canvass the difficulty of judging politicians through the lens of integrity. And I query, or my, I, I indicate that's difficult because the layers of responsibility that politicians have are many indeed. And many of the issues with which they have to deal are very complex. In any particular circumstance, the, the answer to the question, what is the right thing to do, depends on judgments about what interests they're supposed to be serving and what policy choices they actually have. And how a person of integrity should act is dependent on the nature of the questions faced and in whose or what interest he or she should be acting. So it's an interesting question, where does a politician's duty lie? Later on I will discuss how some seem to cut through these dilemmas and are judged even by people who disagree with them as acting in a principled way despite the twists and turns which I would say are inescapable in political life. The truth is that government and politics are hard work and difficult. Both necessarily involve compromise. Uh, was it Whitlam who said, only the impotent are pure? Behind the theatre of politics, most decisions involve choices between imperfect approaches. And let me illustrate those by practical examples which came within my own political life. Since budgets are always limited, it seems a wise and necessary principle to focus assistance on the needy. This is done very well in the Australian social security system. We, more than any, almost any country in the world, have a system of means tests and assets tests, which mean there are benefits for those who have nothing and a reducing scale of benefits for those who have income and assets of their own. Now, at the same time, it's accepted even on the left of politics, although I don't think that still exists anymore, that it's important to encourage and even demand self-help. There's the matter of mutual obligation. Uh, self-help advances self-respect and human dignity. And the present Prime Minister, who has allegedly come from the left of politics in Australia, seems to be a strong supporter of this second principle of self-help, with her references to her hard-working <coughs> parents and the need for people to work. But this excellent principle, which has been long espoused by the Liberal Party, is in direct conflict with the earlier principle I mentioned. The more you use means and income tests to limit access to income support, the more you create poverty traps. As earned income rises, there are high rates of withdrawal of income through those tests and the additional impact of income tax. As a result, people coming off welfare, as they become earners, may pay the highest effective marginal tax rates of anyone in the country. So this is a clear disincentive to self-help. So, one of the many lessons I learned in administering social security before some of the people in this audience were born, I hasten to add, was that whatever proposal was put forward, it could be subject to a principled objection by the departments of treasury and finance. If what was proposed was a general benefit, 
Treasury and Finance could oppose it because it failed to, assist, to focus assistance on the needy. Perfectly rational. On the other hand, if what was proposed limited benefit through income and assets tests, it was said that it would increase poverty traps. In each case, the objections were factually correct. The problem is somehow to accommodate these conflicting principles in a system which is designed to ensure there's an adequate safety net for Australians in need and that as far as possible we provide for ourselves. And there are constant adjustments to the system to find the most economical and humane balance. The most recent, the idea that we would raise the income tax threshold to 20,000, which removes that problem of taxation and withdrawal uh, within that uh, income level. So the point I'm making is that compromise is necessary between those principles in any welfare system. So the decisions you make seldom, if ever, go to the integrity of politicians. Rather, politicians have to make necessarily subjective judgments about, be about the best compromise available at the time to serve the public interest. Now, clearly, political issues will affect that judgment. We live in a democracy, thank heavens, and the grey vote is powerful. And the government's survival depends on public approval. But the point here is that policy judgments are seldom between a principled or an unprincipled decision. So a starting point, I think, for making it to when you're judging politicians is to remember that whatever policy choices they make, they're likely to be open to valid criticism. At the same time, the adversarial nature of the system leads the politician to defend any decision as though it was without fault. This defence is usually a nonsense. To everybody except your rusted on supporters who would agree with you if you said black was white, it's open to challenge. And the rational defence for most decisions that politicians make is that it was the best choice available. But that defence is not absolute enough to satisfy your supporters and it makes it easier for your critics. If you move beyond the difficulty of you know, what's the right answer in a policy sense? And you say, well, we expect politicians to be guided by values. We find exactly the same sort of dilemmas. Admirable values in conflict. If I could quote Sir Gerard Brennan, the previous Chief Justice of the High Court, he said, no value can be stated in terms that are universal and absolute. Liberty and equality are estimable values. But absolute liberty can be the enemy of equality, and absolute equality would demand the curtailing of liberty. Where does duty lie when you're making political decisions? And these, what are really judgment calls. Uh, now, quite apart from the inherent difficulties in making what might be judged right decisions, politicians face an array of often conflicting areas of obligation. For whom are they politically responsible and to whom are they accountable? Now, this is not an academic presentation, as you'll already have worked out. This is simply drawn from long experience of working within the political system. On the basis of that experience, I would say that the claims on a politician's loyalty are many. Uh, start with the individual himself or herself. The person's personal political philosophy and policy views may be highly developed. Mine certainly were by the time I went into Parliament. And you owe it to yourself to be true to those views as far as possible. There's also likely to be a family involved with expectations about what the individual stands for. And it's a family which may make very significant personal sacrifices to enable and sustain a political career. And then you have your close supporters, people who believe in you and what you stand for. Many politicians have these as key contributors to campaigns and as providers of moral support. As with self and family, those people are owed something. There's an element of accountability to them. There's a level of obligation not to advantage them, but to live up to their faith in you. And then there's the political party you join. Most politicians in Australia are in Parliament purely because they've been endorsed by a political party. If they'd endorse someone else, someone else would be in your seat. That party has legitimate expectations that the person it has it is selected to carry its banner will advance its views. Yet that party's views on particular issues 
may be totally contrary to the individual's views, may be co totally contrary to other elements of the party, the national party level or the, in other states, from different um, uh, parliamentary colleagues. And yet there's clearly a level of obligation there. And let me illustrate that at a personal level. I was the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs in the Fraser Government, charged with the responsibility of administering policies which were totally obnoxious <coughs> to my state party. I happened to support them strongly and my family supported them strongly. But the party which controlled my political life and future, my endorsing party, absolutely loathed what I was putting forward. I found facing hostile audiences in Western Australia quite difficult. And I would mentally sit my children in the audience so that I would not say anything that I would not say in front of them. This is because there were deep conflicts of obligation to my endorsing party, to what I believed in, and they had to be managed. This was not this was not an easy set of choices in terms of judging because my state party may well have said, what integrity has this man got? He accepts our endorsement, but he doesn't carry out what we think is fundamentally important and what Sir Charles Court has told us is absolutely important. So there's the electorate which has voted you in. That's another area of obligation. We're not like the United States, uh, partly because of our party system. We have a much tighter party system and playing your electorate is more pronounced there than in our Westminster style system. But I must say that on my experience, electors find it very hard to accept Burke's idea expressed in the letter to the electors of Bristol that they had elected him to exercise his judgment and not to vote according to their will. Now then there's another layer that's added in. There's the parliamentary or party or caucus that you automatically are part of when you go into parliament. And that too demands accountability. And how often did you hear John Howard and other leaders say, disunity is death. You must stick together at all costs. And then of course, you do actually become a member of parliament. And when you become a member of parliament, you swear or affirm that you will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors according to law. And the constitution requires you to swear that oath. Those of us who are republic in our beliefs have to give that a proper meaning as allegiance to the people of Australia and their interests. But clearly there is a level of obligation there to show allegiance to something beyond self, family, supporters, party or electorate. And then there's the quite separate set of obligations which are imposed on the front bench. Successive Labor governments, Keating and Rudd, have sworn to well and truly serve the Commonwealth of Australia, her land and her people. So help me God swearing allegiance to the nation and not to the head of state. John Howard put the Queen back in, but left out her heirs and successors. But the precise terms of the, <laughs> the, precise terms of the oath don't matter. Rather, these various oaths are a reminder of the layered accountabilities of members of parliament and of the executive. The oaths suggest, at least to me, that the ultimate duty is to the people of Australia, beyond those other legitimate claims on loyalty. Now, I think in this audience, we all understand some or all of this. We know that ministers have to accept cabinet solidarity or leave office. Shadow ministers accept a similar obligation. Can there be any doubt that at times it's inevitable that decisions by individual politicians or their support for party or executive decisions will mean they will be disappointing themselves or their families or their supporters or their endorsing party their electorates or their parliamentary party, any or all of which may disagree with the decision conscientiously taken. Any of the disappointed may regard a decision with which they, degree, they disagree as lacking in integrity. So seeing a lack of integrity in a politician because you disagree with an action or decision may be a harsh judgment on a person who is, and I go back to the quote, is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there's no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds. Now something else has to be added to this mix, and I want to say something about the Westminster system as it operates in Australia. 
it's very fashionable to decry political parties, and yet political parties are not an add-on to the Westminster system. Stable political parties are an essential part of providing stable government and a functioning parliamentary democracy. A stable opposition party ensures you have an alternative government if you want to vote out the government. We've long raised eyebrows at the instability of some European parliaments, with parties that are more fragmented and less stable and disciplined than our own and Britain's. Australian political parties are more highly disciplined than those in the British Parliament, and in my view, too highly disciplined on legislative issues. But again, the choice is not between perfection and imperfection, but rather between approaches, each of which has, which has advantages and disadvantages. The importance of stable political parties is a big complication as far as determining where political duty lies. During the 1980s, and the older people here will remember the 1980s as a period of very sound government by Labor and a very difficult and divided opposition. During that period, the sustainability and talent base of the Liberal Party became a major issue for me and some other Liberals. And that influenced many of my decisions, including about the recruitment of new talented MPs, and most difficult, about leadership. To not have an effective opposition capable of taking government is to hollow out our Australian democracy. Without an effective opposition ready to take the reins of government, the electorate has no one to turn to. And in that sense, the party interest becomes the national interest. The dismissal in 1975 flowed from a belief in the Parliamentary Liberal Party that Australia's future was seriously threatened by an incompetent and scandal-ridden government. What was done by the then opposition was seen by critics as lacking in integrity. The appointments of senators unsympathetic to the Labor government to fill two casual Senate vacancies, Labor vacancies, appointments made by non-Labor state governments, had altered the party balance in the Senate. This was seen by many as constitutionally improper and contributed to the claims of illegitimacy when supply was deferred. I've tried to draw in making these comments on personal experience to explain why politics is difficult, why politicians inevitably disappoint, and why we should be careful in our judgments about the integrity of those in Parliament. But are we entitled to feel that politics should be better than it currently is? There seems to be a whispering in many hearts that we are being shortchanged. Why? I include myself among the disaffected. And what led me on the eve of the last election, when asked by my local newspaper who would win the election, to say that it was Hobson's choice. Neither side deserved to win. And what led the Accountability Roundtable to want to discuss integrity in Parliament? I can't speak for the Accountability Roundtable, but my election time disillusion flowed from the fact that two opposing party leaders, both of whom I had liked and respected, seemed to have disappeared during the course of the campaign. What I had liked had been replaced by individuals whose only guiding principle seemed to be to find advantage in key marginal electorates. They conveyed to me that they were without regard to anything beyond the immediate electoral interest of their respective sides. There was in the campaign no story about Australia that made sense. And wherever I went in Australia during the campaign, I sensed a similar disillusion. When my prediction was reflected in the hung parliament, it seemed that my limited sample of the dissatisfied reflected a wider dissatisfaction. When I was invited quite some time ago to give this talk, I started to collect comment about the state of the parties and of politics. But due to the volume of critical comment, I quickly gave up. Rather than collecting the many expressions of dissatisfaction, it may be more constructive to look at what are the foundations of purposeful politics directed to the national interest, and in particular, the long-term interest of Australia. What are the sea anchors in a system what are the stabilising factors which enable the electorate to discern the direction of travel, to put individual decision, decisions, whether popular or unpopular, into an understandable context? Where is the story to come from which enables single issues to be seen as part of an overall program which can be judged within a context rather than any, taken as a freestanding publication to be judged in isolation on the basis of who loses from that particular policy? 
There are a number of factors which, in isolation or together, can clarify what a government stands for, a number of ways in which politicians may demonstrate with some clarity how they will judge where their duty lies, and we can see integrity in their actions. One is purposeful leadership. The quality of individual politicians can be such that it's clear what ends they are serving. This clarity usually comes from a small minority of parliamentarians. I really love what The Economist said about this back in the days when I was involved in politics in Australia. It suggested that the House of Commons was full of worthy men and women, but that at any time only about 10% of them made a difference to the nation's politics. They suggested that if you replaced the rest with other worthy men and women, no one except the immediate families of those replaced would even notice. I might say the economists put a really good twist on this. They said the object should be to turn the 90% over as quickly as possible. So we suggest really high retirement benefits after eight years diminishing annually thereafter. And then the dross will all leave, <laughs> which I thought was quite cute. But whether you agree or disagree with the 10% rule, and I don't think it is a bad rule actually, the personal characteristics of politicians such as Robert Menzies, Malcolm Fraser, John Howard, Charles Court, Neville Rand, Steve Brax and Bob Hawke, to name just some, gave us a pretty clear idea of what sort of government they were leading. We knew what to expect in any particular situation during their various leaderships. They may have made mistakes, and of course they did. They went up and down in the polls. They were the subject of savage criticism. But no one spent much time speculating on who was the real Bob Menzies or considering the relevance of their swimming costumes. They could be liked or disliked, abused or ridiculed, but the complaints would be focused quite differently from the complaints we have today. We can't guarantee the quality of those we elect, but individuals who are known to stand for something, the so-called conviction politicians, are a steadying influence even from the back bench. The member for Wakefield from 1958 to 1977, who would not be known to any of the younger members of this audience, Charles Robertson, commonly known as Bert Kelly, with his long-running modest member column in the Australian Financial Review, ploughed what was for a very long time a lonely furrow advocating tariff reduction. He didn't have to cross the floor to demonstrate integrity. His consistent advocacy of a thought-through intellectual position did that for him. He was one of those who sowed the seeds of policy changes made after he left Parliament. And those changes are universally seen as the basis of our present prosperity. It was leadership from behind, of the sort I witnessed when I, before I went into Parliament, in the backbench careers of Bill Wentworth, Kim Beasley Senior and Gordon Bryant in the field of Aboriginal Affairs. Now this leads to a second possibility for enabling stability of purpose, or I suppose accessibility of purpose. Adherence to a coherent and declared ideology. Historically, Liberals may have fought socialist, Labor's socialist ideas and Labor fought the Liberals' commitment to property, individuals and enterprise, but each could claim integrity in Parliament and the electorate as being true to a set of ideas. There was for a long period broad cross-party support for what is described as the Federation Settlement, including tariff protection, centralised wage fixing and the White Australia policy. Within that broad framework, each side published and was judged against a set of ideas. Some of our present difficulties flow from bipartisan support of a more open economy. To the extent there's substantial shared ground, establishing political difference can become focused on individual policy issues without any coherent pattern or explanation for the policy choices made. I'll mention a little later the wet-dry debate in the Liberal Party in the late 70s, early 80s as an example of how policy coherence can be achieved to a point where there's observable integrity in decision making. The third possibility for political purpose was a reality for much of our political history. <coughs> Broad-based political parties with large numbers of members spread through large numbers of branches, exercising real authority over policy and candidate selections, ensured that the mass of party members themselves are a sea anchor in the system. With memberships numbering in the hundreds of thousands, accepting responsibility to debate policy, 
to raise funds, to man polling booths, to select candidates, political leaders had reference points they could not afford to ignore. While the Liberal Party eschewed party control of parliamentarians and the Labor Party chose a constitutional link between party and parliamentarians, in each case the party members had a role of substance. I grew up in that system and was part of it for 16 years before entering Parliament. Over that time I attended not dozens but hundreds of meetings held in party rooms, in private houses, in halls or wherever branch members had decided to meet. We debated the present and the future of our state and country and we learned to confront and deal with differences face to face. We selected candidates and moved policy motions up the line from branch to division to the state conference and the national conference. I still remember the satisfaction of getting amendments to the Western Australian Mining Act from policy work done in the North Perth branch of the Liberal Party in 1968. It was community-based politics. And after I entered Parliament, I watched with absolute horror its replacement by, in my state by factional branch stacking of the sort I'd associate with the worst elements of the trade union movement. But in the days of mass membership of political parties, they were at a minimum like a national jury. Politicians had to engage with their respective parties and show respect. Later generations of politicians have chosen to reverse the system, to control and neuter the membership. The exodus of party members is the result and we have lost a stabilising influence. The professionalisation of politics, and by that I mean the technicians, the smart guys who sit in front of screens and tell the politicians what people are saying today, they've taken over from the policy makers. The increased skills now available to read the public mood, to determine what the public will accept today and what words can be heard today without rejection, has led to the reversal of the rule laid down for me by my friend and colleague Jim Carlton himself for a time a party professional. When we worked together on economic issues during the 1980s, he made the point that the first task is to find the right answer. The second task is to work out how to sell it. This is the antithesis of an approach based on finding out what you can sell today to provide the answer for tomorrow. I finally turn to the lessons that can be learned from success. It's common ground that the Hawke-Keating government, along with the reforming period of the Howard Costello government, laid the foundation of our resilience in the face of successive international economic crises. Where did that transition from the Federation settlement, the closed economy, to a new order of a more open economy come from? Malcolm Fraser claims, with some justification, that the work of his office and his department was an influential starting point during the period of his government. My judgment, with which I think he disagrees, is that the Fraser government was in the difficult position of being at the cusp of the move to a new order. But what is certain is that the intense policy debates of the late 1970s and the early 1980s between the wets and dries in the Liberal Party were an essential part of creating a new framework of thought within which governments of whatever colour would operate. Those debates were of course public and not confined to the Liberal Party but MPs played a significant role. Industry bodies and academics were prominent and of course there were slogans then too. Uh, the expression, the shorthand of wet and dry were both slogans and at times expressions of mutual contempt. But there was powerful policy content in the debate, content. Were we as Australians to accept the suggestion we would become the poor white trash of Asia would we succumb to the Argentinian disease? The prospect of economic weaknesses and decline was seen as clear and present dangers to Australia, which the change agents believed had to be confronted. Who were those agents of change? Among the parliamentarians were John Hyde, Jim Carlton and Peter Schack. It's worth noting there were few political rewards in terms of preferment for those activists, but they changed both party and country. When the coalition lost office in 1983, few expected the new government to act as it subsequently did. I asked, did anyone, least of all the Labor Party and the trade union movement? But when Hawke confronted the divisions between capital and Labor and sought consensus on new approaches, his leadership was an important element in moving the country to a new paradigm. 
What was remarkable in comparison with today is that the Liberal National Opposition stuck to the broadly dry approach and largely resisted the political temptation to wedge Labor on difficult reforms. Major changes, all of which had substantial elements of interest group opposition, were let through by an opposition seized by the idea that economic reform was essential. Of course, there was opposition around the edges. We decried the Automotive Industry Authority as an unnecessary piece of bureaucracy. And who can forget Andrew Peacock's campaign? Well, who, who over who, 50 can forget his campaign, remember? I'm the assets test inspector. He went round the country and nearly won the 1984 election. But the fact of the matter is that yet it was in fact remarkable that during years of leadership instability and changes, the opposition consistently stuck to the broad approach to economic policy thrashed out before 1983 in those difficult debates. Current and recent oppositions may have set course based on remembering that there were no political rewards for letting a government achieve hard and popular reforms. Under both Peacock and Howard in the 1980s, the opposition remained just that, an opposition. It was an unacknowledged and unrewarded partner in the modernisation of the Australian economy. Premier O'Farrell's blockage while in opposition of electricity privatisation in New South Wales, like Abbott's stance on carbon trading, contributed to destabilising government with a view to achieving the core aim of winning office. My view is that on all sides, our political leaders sleep well at night, believing they are acting with integrity in the circumstances they face. If they do have sleepless nights, it's more likely to be about, to be about the fear of not winning the electoral context, contest. In the measure of political morality, they would give themselves a high mark. But on the Labor side, the warnings of such Labor luminaries as Neville Rann, Rodney Cavalier, Senator John Faulkner about the decline of the party and its purpose, as well as the comments of journalists such as Mike Steckerty, might give them and their leaders cause to stop and reconsider where their duty to Australia lies. On the Liberal side, the warnings of Peter Costello and Peter Reith and sympathetic journalists, that is sympathetic to the opposition, like Paul Kelly and Dennis Shanahan, might have the same effect. The way we've operated our political system is at the heart of our dissatisfaction with politics and politicians. Without a clear ideology to uphold, without an active citizen-based organisation to which they are accountable, without a clear personal philosophy which guides and explains the logic of individual decisions, without a consistent policy framework for which you can argue, without competent execution of decisions taken, you arrive where we are now. For an opposition that presents an opportunity, it can say it's not to blame. But if its opposition is also without policy coherence and the same elements are lacking, the risk is coming to government to repeat the errors which gained you government. This is not a risk to politicians alone. Much more important, it's a risk to all of us. Australia faces challenges in foreign policy, in the international and national economic circumstances, in the efficiency and adequacy of our taxation system, in maintaining economic stability in a volatile resource environment, in an ageing population, in variable weather even before considering climate change, in water and food security, in social harmony, in indigenous affairs, in immigration and refugee policy. And most of these challenges require difficult decisions, difficult choices. That requires a society brought to the realisation that these decisions are in the interest of us all. Does anyone believe that current politics is allowing a civil discourse about these challenges which might permit community understanding to underpin effective government? I started with a quotation suggesting we should respect the current practitioners of the dark art of politics. And I express my respect and indeed my thanks to those who take on the task. But the <coughs> whispering in my heart is captured by another ex-politician, Vaclav Havel. And I quote him, in democratic conditions, it is important that politics be more than just a technology of power, but that it provides a genuine service to its citizens, a service that is as disinterested as possible, based on certain ideals, a service that follows the moral order that stands above us, 
and that takes into account the longer term interests of the human race and not just appeals to the public at any given moment. It's a service that resists becoming no more than the interplay of particular interests or pragmatic schemes that ultimately conceal a single aim, to remain in power at all costs. And here the quote, if I may break in, I suppose genuflects a little to Hoover. Of course, it's one thing to philosophise independently just for the sake of it, and something else altogether to achieve things in politics. That I admit. But that doesn't mean that politics must surrender all its ideals, <coughs> deny its heart and become a mere self-propelled technocratic process. I close by saying that current Australian politics is not meeting the demands or the standards of Vaclav Havel that politics must be more than the technology of power. There is a need to define our national purpose. There's a need to have a light on the hill. There's a need for a story which explains where all the different policies fit and how they advance the national purpose. There's a need to re-engage the electors by giving them a story about Australia they can believe in. Thank you. I wish to express uh, appreciation uh, to Fred. Uh, Fred, I think uh, all of us tonight will understand that you're as fine a person as any to have served in the Australian Parliament and someone who has a very proud record which we very much value for what you've done in the past and for the contribution you make at events such as this tonight. You spoke of the uh, lack of a comprehensive vision for Australia at the moment and uh, I suspect that part of it is because of the enormity of what the science tells us of the changes that are going to be wrought by climate change or the changes which will be necessary to try and curb the effects of climate change. And there's little evidence that there is, at least in politics and not much more even in the scientific community, uh, precious little evidence of a comprehensive vision of how to approach the enormity of what mankind is facing. But I think what you have shown us is the sort of values and processes which are really important if we are to address these, uh, these major problems. And what you've shown us is that it is necessary to develop a vision and to approach that vision with intellectual consistency. And I think you displayed that for us tonight in your opening remarks, which were about your concerns for the rights of Australia's Indigenous community. And the views that you put to us on that tonight were based very much on values and on integrity. Those values were values which were uh, strongly held and values which you have interpreted and expressed uh, with great honesty and great sincerity. And I think we can all see that that is a fundamental aspect of the way in which you approach this and other issues. Uh, you went on to provide us with a very insightful analysis of the place of integrity in politics and to highlight for those who haven't been in politics the competing values and the competing interests which are always at play in almost any policy question that we might uh, uh, be concerned about, might, might have an interest in, and that there is inevitably uh, competing calls when it comes to the duty which is to be fulfilled, powers which are to be exercised. And you've also drawn our attention to the enormous uh, tensions which the individual politician does have, tensions in their personal life between the values and the things they're asked to do, uh, tensions between the time that they make available to spend with their family and support their family versus the bottomless pit of demands from the electorate and demands from uh, the political party uh, one went in office. And you concluded by pointing out that what we need is an ideology, a set of values, policy coherence via civil discourse. And that final point, it seems to me, is an enormously important lesson for all of us. But it's only through that civil discourse that as a community we can develop those values and express them into uh, policy proposals to address whatever the issues are that are facing us. So Fred, you've uh, confirmed your high reputation for us tonight, shown us that it's well founded, and we thank you very much for the insight that you've shared with us.